Namaste. My dear esteemed guests and friends, it is my great pleasure to be speaking with you today about decolonizing the Bhagavad Gita and why English words that undermine Sanskrit meanings and Vedic culture must be removed from the translation process. When the English decided to colonize India and translate Bard's sacred Sanskrit texts to English, they knowingly or unknowingly were undermining the great culture of Bharat. There is not a translated Vedic text on the market today that isn't guilty of using this mistranslated Sanskrit. Even the sincerest Sanskrit scholars do not know English with enough precision to correctly solve these many translation issues, and thus they unknowingly repeat the Oxford colonizing rhetoric. I know. I did the same thing at first. Over the last 10 years, while translating a new English version of the world's most translated and mistranslated Vedic text, the Bhagavad Gita, I undertook the task to remove all the colonial Western or Christian distortions. Words like Lord, Heaven, Hell, Sin, Soul, Many Gods, Religion do not belong in any explanation of the Vedic Sanatana Dharma. And there were many more. I'm certain that the time has arrived for a reassessment of translating all Vedic texts into the English language with attention to the correctness of the words used in the translation process. I also propose that the message in the Gita is a universal message, which may have landed in Bharat, but its message is clearly meant to reach all of humanity. To reach humanity, it needs to be accessible in the clearest English possible, and of course, in many other languages. The English word translation is derived from Latin and has two components, trans, or a cross, and latio, to carry. This process of moving meaning from one language to another was brilliantly described by the well-known linguist Umberto Eco in his book, Mouse or Rat? Translation as Negotiation. There, he gives the examples that the word rat and mouse are represented by only one word in many European languages. When this dilemma occurs with nouns representing objects, it is troublesome to the translator. But when it happens with subjective terminology, words very dense with meaning, the difficulty of carrying complex meanings from one language to another is much more problematic. Linguists refer to this dilemma of the density of meaning in language as fat or skinny words. In English, the word pizza is a skinny word with little ambiguity, whereas the word love is a fat and very dense word with many nuances of meaning according to its usage. The word love is intrinsically vague in English and therefore requires considerable accompanying words to illuminate its many nuances of meaning. This word love is used in English to describe many situations, objects and beings, and thus the meaning is obscure. Do we love pizza the same way we love our friends and family? Yet we use the same word. To add to the irony, the English word love came originally from the Sanskrit word lobha, or greed. So without other modifiers, the meaning of love is not intrinsic to the word, and therefore does not have a clear and specific meaning when it is used in a translation of other words whose meaning is more precise. I think you get my drift. And speaking of drift, one must also consider the other big issue, and that is of linguistic drift. English is especially susceptible. Think of Shakespeare's language. No one can understand it now. But Shakespeare did introduce a thousand words into the English language to smarten it up. Over time, 
Linguists also added Greek and Latin words to English for the same effect, especially in scientific subjects. It is also the reason why words like gay, cool, and hip no longer mean what they originally meant just a few years ago. This is the reason why there are two kinds of dictionaries in the English language. One is called a usage dictionary. And the other is referred to as an etymological dictionary. Remember, all words in a language have a history. They came from somewhere. And often, they are the modified or mispronounced words from the language that preceded them, from which they were borrowed or stolen. Most English speakers do not even know of etymological dictionaries and confuse the current everyday usage of a word with its original and probably now obscured meaning. I am proposing that the historical moment has arrived for a reassessment of translating all Vedic texts into English language, entirely decolonized and with precise attention paid to the correctness of meaning of those fat Sanskrit words. And we must do our best to combine as many English words or phrases as are necessary in the definition to make these dense words understandable to the reader. I also propose that the message in the Gita is a universal message, which may have landed in Bharat, but its message is meant for all of humanity. Now that I've explained the problem, let's talk about the process of finding a solution. I have just spent the last 10 years working on a new book, a decolonized translation of the Gita called The Bhagavad Gita Comes Alive, a radical translation. In the first three years, I thought I was just doing a clearer translation, not unlike the rest. But then I found an etymological dictionary which took the English words all the way back to Sanskrit roots, called Origins, by Eric Partridge. It literally set my project back for years as it made me realize the extent of the mischief that the first Christian English-speaking scholars had injected knowingly and unknowingly into the so-called meanings of the Sanskrit words, when they started carelessly translating Sanskrit words to supposed English equivalents. Part of the problem is the complexity of Sanatana Dharma concepts that do not even exist in the Christian or Western worldview. After all, modern science and the three Abrahamic religions do have one thing in common. They believe in only one tiny lifetime. So how were they to explain karma, multiple universes, Brahman, male and female divines, or an antiquity that stretched way beyond their limited conception of existence and reality? Words like Svarga became heaven, Atma became soul, Naraka became hell, Dharma became religion, Ishta became Lord, Pop became sin, Mantra became prayer, Archavigraha became idol, Devas and Devis became the many gods, or worse, the demi-gods, and I could go on. But before I begin, I want to say, in service of all the great Acharyas from whom we learned the Vedic Vidya, I bow to you all in dedication and seva. Let me explain why some of these words are so inappropriate and sometimes outright offensive and undermine Sanatan Dharma and must be removed from our texts and teachings. Let's take first the word God and the many gods. What exactly does the English word God mean? If you consult an etymological dictionary, you'll see that it came into English from Dutch as Gut, which came from German, Gutam, and from the Sanskrit where it originated, Hutam. Brahmarpanam, Brahma Agnau, Brahma Hutam, the smoke 
arising from an Agni Hotra Yagya, a.k.a., in the words of the Christians, a pagan fire sacrifice. And yet that word, the smoke from the offering, is the root and proper meaning of the Christian word God. Therefore, ask yourself, is it a translation? Is it translatable? Ask yourself, is it translatable as Bhagavan? Is it a substitute for Bhagavan? And as you probably know, the word Bhagavan is described in the Puranas as having six specific characteristics, or Bhagas, and Van is the one who possesses them. There is no resemblance to the two words, except faintly the concept of supremacy. Therefore, God is not a synonym for Bhagavan and should never have been used in the Bhagavad Gita. Next is idol and deity. The word idol comes from the Greek idea, which comes from the Sanskrit videya or vidya, or became eventually idea in English. But idea is ideal, and ideal in person is your idol. Do you see how confused and jumbled it is? Calling the devas and the various deities idols by the Abrahamic religions is their complete lack of understanding of etymology, and that each of those depictions, each of those deities, is in fact an ideal, a being, but leads to ideal behavior in humans and gives credit where credit is due in the administration of the universe. The next is Lord. Oh, this one is wonderful. Lord is from the Old English Haflard and Haflady. Haflard means the land lord on the estate in England who has peasants working for him, and Haflady is his wife. So this gives us the paired words lord and lady. Lord and lady also meant loaf lord. Huff lard is loaf. So these are the two, the lady who bakes the bread and the lord of the estate, of the manor, who guards the bread and gives it out to the peasants. This is the actual meaning of lord, one who distributes bread to the peasants. And you'll notice that it's the key word in one of the most important, if not the most important, Christian prayer, the so-called Lord's Prayer. So now tell me, is bread maker and bread distributor the meaning of the Sanskrit word Isha, Ishta, Devata? Is that really what they mean? Is it a synonym then? Not at all. And finally, let's look at the word soul and Atma. The word soul is S-O-L originally, and it means the sun in Latin. So that luminous planet in the sky is Sol. So then the word was used to describe that part of us which is luminous. Well, that's not too far off, you might say. But actually, Atma is described in great detail. You remember that souls cannot reincarnate. They only have one life. So please tell me, what did they do wrong? Because somehow they were thrown out of heaven. And they could go to hell for what they do in one life. So are they really like the Atma? Not at all. Because the Gita and all the Vedic texts say, you can't burn it, you can't destroy it, you can't cut it, it doesn't die, it can't die, it's immortal. It goes from body to body. It's on a long journey of knowing and experiencing and gathering experience on its own, which is noble and beautiful in the Dharmic culture. So should we call Atma soul? Not at all. In fact, the word Atma eventually became the Latin atomic, a tome, which means you can't cut it. A tome, uncuttable. Turns out the atom 
was. Even the word Adam comes from the word Adam and Eve. And Adam is Atma, and Eve is Jiva. You know, the Jiva Atma. All these travesties of translation and misunderstanding do no justice to the depth of meaning of the Vedic philosophy, and yet they have been made synonymous, which is entirely inaccurate. To summarize, these are the five things I did in this translation of the Bhagavad Gita. Number one, I removed the toxic colonizing English words. Second, I left certain essential Sanskrit words that do not have English synonyms in the verses with a brief meaning defined within quotes. Third, I added a comprehensive glossary of those Sanskrit words for the reader to further understand more complex meanings never using a one-to-one -one word definition. Fourth, I clarified the English words used in the verses so they do not interfere with the Sanskrit meanings of the text. And finally, fifth, there are no purports. It simply reads as a smooth conversation between Krishna and Arjuna, as if the reader is there listening. My vision is that over the next few years, this effort will lead to injecting hundreds of new Sanskrit words into everyday English usage with their proper understanding, not the colonized version, just as Latin and Greek were used to smarten up English. Sanskrit, the mother language of both Greek, Latin, and all their derivatives, is powerful, and it can be used to increase the Dharmic literacy of the global English-speaking communities. There are millions of inspired yogis who are not born in India and have seriously taken up the Vedic Sanatan Dharma, and now they are starting to learn Sanskrit. It would be a shame if the Hindu community does not lead that movement to explain Sanskrit and Sanatan Dharma using proper English and correct Sanskrit. Given the addition of these new Sanskrit words, everyone will have the opportunity to speak and perfect the qualities and dharmic characteristics that are so needed in our modern world. Since Hindu children are using and being educated in the English language, I propose that this Bhagavad Gita comes alive, a radical translation, will offer the clarity and correct understanding of the Vedic culture and will give the next generation an understanding that they can be proud of, and it will inspire their own personal development for the rest of their lives. The Bhagavad Gita comes alive, is radical, because it signals a new era in translation of the Vedic knowledge. And so, my beloved friends, Utishta, Utishta, arise. As Bhagavan said to Arjun, and thank you for inviting me to speak at this year's Waves Conference. Pranams, pranams, dandavat, pranams.